1977 Universal Pictures horror film directed by Elliot Silverstein, most famous at the time for the comedy western Cat Baloo, and written by the team behind Clint Eastwood's Pale Rider and The Gauntlet. The film stars James Berlin, Kathleen Lloyd, John Marley and Ronnie Cox. The film also boasts having the Church of Satan leader Anton LaVey as a technical consultant. The text that appears at the beginning of the film comes from his Satanic Bible. While this may seem like an interesting and quirky fact and may have legitimized the film in some way, it really didn't. He has put his name to a number of trashy horror films at the time which aren't really well remembered. The Car is probably his most mainstream film. Anyway, The Car tells the story of a mysterious, unmarked black car which starts running down people in a New Mexico community. The attacks escalate and when the current sheriff is killed, it is up to Josh Brolin and his police force to stop the car. The ultimate revelation is that the car has no driver and appears to have a mind of its own. It may seem like this is a spoiler for a major plot point. This is given away in the marketing of the film, so I wouldn't worry about that. I do wonder if the supernatural element of the film was all that necessary. Obviously it's a big plot point, but really the idea of a mysterious, unseen hit-and-run driver is a good enough idea on its own. I imagine if they did go down that route it would have drawn comparisons to Steven Spielberg's suspense film, Duel. But actually, what we have here is essentially Steven Spielberg's Jaws with a little sprinkling of The Exorcist over the top. The idea sounds a little corny and goofy, and it cannot be denied that it is a goofy movie. The plot is simple, going from A to B to C, it's pulpy, and it makes no apologies for it. Certainly there are great movies that have goofy plots, but they are taken seriously. This is not one of them, and whether it is the performances, or the stunts, or the set pieces, there is a goofy air to the whole proceedings. But it does get better and begins to take itself more seriously over the course of the film. I suppose the first thing that sticks out like a sore thumb in this film are the performances, which range from the seriously overwrought, to the distractingly goofy, to the just plain wooden. All the performances suffer from these very early on, and it does not really help that roughly 60% of the dialogue seems to be post-dubbed. In fact, it makes it all the more distracting. It's a shame, because the film is more or less filled with big actors from the time, like James Berlin and R.G. Armstrong. Even the kids are a relatively well-known pair of actress sisters, appearing in films like Halloween, Assault on Precinct 13, and Disney's Witch Mountain movies. I even spotted Ernie F. Osati, a regular actor and stunt performer in such films as The Poseidon Adventure and The Towering Inferno. I have to say, probably the worst offender in all the performances is John Marley as the old sheriff. He is just so wooden and his ADR does not match his acting at all. I always find it odd when actors from such great films as The Godfather seem to really slum it in other films. I suppose they don't care about these other films, but that's hardly professional. You would think that also the director or editors may be able to salvage something from what they get. To be fair, the performances do seem to get better over the course of the film, with Ronnie Cox giving among the more understated performances, and in particular Kathleen Lloyd doing rather well when she's given the chance. It seems that she was a regular on TV, but this is one of only a small handful of films she's done. Overall though, I would say the central performances are a mixed bag. The film does seem to have some moments where it tries to give some characters and situations depth, but really none of them work so well. Some even confuse the situation a little more. There is a domestic abuse subplot which seems to be forgotten by the final act in the film when the abusive, antagonistic and dangerous husband is recruited into the band of heroes without any real redemption or understanding. In fact, it seems like they recruit him because he's dangerous. One minute he's considered the bad guy, and the next he's the good guy. The change is so jarring. That's also not mentioning another subplot where the abused wife and the old sheriff seem to have had a history. All that is quickly forgotten at the midway point after the sheriff dies. Also, early in the film with the first victims, there seems to be some confusion about them, as they are not discovered until later on, so it's assumed the young man may have run off with the girl. Okay, that's fine, but this development never goes anywhere and just prolongs the early investigation scenes. Probably the more successful of these attempts at adding depth is one of the heroes has an alcohol problem. 
though even then this is forgotten quickly to make way for the final showdown. All these don't really add to anything to the film and just add as distractions, I would say. I imagine this was all added again to emulate Jaws and its depth of characters, but Jaws in terms of storyline and subplots is actually very simple. In fact, a lot of unnecessary plot points from the original novel were culled when making the final film. Less is more in the end, and the car would have benefited with much less, I feel. One thing this film does is show the police in a positive light, which is actually a breath of fresh air when most movies of any genre depict the police as either worse than useless or corrupt to the core. Even films about the police seem to fall into these categories. While this little horror film people tend to forget and make fun of, actually takes pains to show the police as resourceful and filled with individuals who are affected by the events that surround them. Had the acting been better, this could have really elevated the film. There are some moments when the otherwise odd-looking car can be quite menacing. Mainly these are the infrequent quiet moments in the film when the car is just idling, watching and waiting to launch its next attack. These sequences make the odd-looking car more strange and mysterious, doing what good filmmaking does in a horror film unsettling the audience despite any silliness on display. It should be noted that the man who designed the car also designed the Batmobile from the 1966 version of Batman. With many disaster horror films, the plot and characterizations can be terrible, but the film is lifted with some good set pieces and action scenes. Sadly, even most of the action scenes fall flat here because they just look fake and obviously staged, with stunt people flailing about as they're hit by the car as if they've just been shot on a World War II film, sped up footage, and some odd choices of trick photography like having the camera at an angle or distracting dissolves and fades. Sometimes the action sequences even suffer from basic continuity errors, like disappearing people who pop in and out of the scene. I do always wonder if sometimes sequences like these are made to deliberately look fake. I can understand realistic looking hit and run accidents can make people feel uncomfortable, but that's kind of the point with the horror film. You can't even make the excuse of it being made when it was, or trying to appeal to a wider audience. Outside of the animatronic shark, the sequences in Jaws don't feel dated or watered down at all. While most of the stunts are obviously staged and filled with some sort of trick photography, sometimes a good stunt can be found. The 196 foot drop from a bridge early in the film is an impressive stunt that probably was the first of its kind at the time. And because it's filmed with a real setting and a real stunt person, it makes it all the more impressive. It's the kind of stunt that can and probably is replicated often in action films today, though with CGI effects, wobbly camera and constant cutting taking off some of the edge. Sometimes just seeing the scene play out straight makes it all the more impressive. Another stunt I was impressed with is during the school band scene where a teacher dodges the car on her way to call for help. I imagine there are some tricks involved here, but it still looks impressive especially considering it looks realistic and the actress is not a stunt woman. The principal set piece of the film is when the car attacks the school van out on rehearsals. Yes, it's not filmed in all that creative a way, and it's got typical gaps in continuity and basic logic as many bad action sequences have, but it still engages you and makes it a fun watch. Another is a scene where the car menaces the heroine, which does build up some suspense and surprises first-time viewers at its conclusion. Regarding its links to the disaster horror genre, the obvious influence here is Steven Spielberg's Jaws, so much so that many see it as a direct rip-off. It does follow the plot of Jaws almost to a T. You have the young people going off on their own and getting attacked in secluded places to start the film off. You have the small town setting, you have the police chief or the sheriff as the hero, the attacks escalate until there is a major attack on a public event, and after an attack hitting too close to home, the heroes band together in a this time it's personal counterattack. To the car's credit, there is no antagonistic town official character, keeping the attacks quiet so the town's big public event can carry on and bring in money spending tourists, thus creating more panic, chaos and deaths later on. No, the central attack on the school band occurs simply because a character does not make a phone call. As unspectacular as that is, it's probably a lot more realistic than people give it credit for. But yeah, I do agree that it is so close to Jaws it could easily be called a remake, and it really doesn't offer anything original into the mix. I suppose overall the film is bogged down in a general goofiness which does gradually lift part way through the film. You may find you remember the goofiness more than the good moments. 
Does it deserve a higher profile similar to Jaws? No. Does it do anything different to enhance the disaster horror genre? Not really. More it goes to show just how genre changing Jaws really was. But I would still suggest it for being entertaining and memorable and part of the genre rather than defining it. Thank <laughs> you.